Okay, Marx part two. Have I just done one video up to now? I can't remember. Uh, and now I want to talk about uh, the stages of history that he sees playing out. I mentioned a little bit of that, uh, about this earlier, but now I want to talk about it more specifically. A and let me remind you what I said, that Marx thought capitalism was an improvement over what happened before. And Marx thought that capitalism did some really important things, all right, and, and, and some things that we can't do without if we are to one day continue this upward ascent towards better and better lives. Uh, the problem in capitalism is that people are forced into a particular line of work. They, they, they can't choose. Um, I'm trying to decide whether I should tell you that at the end. Well, let me hang on with that. Let me hang on. Let, let me just go through the stages of history. Okay, so uh, the way he's looking at it, for example, feudalism evolved into capitalism, which is going to evolve into socialism. Oh, I'm an idiot. which is going to evolve into the big C, communism, all right? And then that'll be the final stage of history, right there. There's a, there's, there's a final stage. And the idea is that in that final stage, people are finally free to live their lives the way they want to. Uh, there's a section in the book about, I don't know if I should jump to that now or not. Well, let me jot these things down. And what else was I going to tell you a minute ago? Uh, let's see. I, yeah, I think it's... Uh, now, these stages of history, we can't get to capitalism unless we go through feudalism. We can't get to socialism unless we go through capitalism. Uh, I was trying to think of a way to explain this in class one day, and this is what I came up with. I don't know how good it is, but so I'm about to subject you. I'm about to subject you to it, so we'll see. Think about powered flight. The Wright brothers at Kitty Hawk, uh, they create the Wright Flyer, the first uh, you know, consistently successful uh, powered flight. And then you think about World War I, these airplanes all had, had two wings uh, and they had to do that in order to create stability. Uh, but they were much more stable than this was. They had to keep flying these to figure out what the mistakes were, what's working well, what's not working. Uh, and then the biplanes you know, were, were the result of that. They were much more stable, uh, but they still needed two wings to keep. But then by World War II, we've got monoplanes, just one wing, all right? Uh, and it was, this was a result of the things we learned from this. And then we have jets by the end of the war, and then space shuttle, and so forth. The idea is that we couldn't skip a stage. We couldn't have gone from the right flyer to jets, all right? Because there were things we learned over the decades that we were reliant on biplanes that allowed us to figure out the technology to do monoplanes that allowed us to figure out the technology to do jets and so forth. You can't skip one of these steps because each step was essential in creating the conditions for the next step. That's where he's coming from, all right? Uh, he's coming from the idea that you can't, and I'm going to show you this specifically here in a moment, you can't get to socialism without capitalism. Capitalism must happen first, right? Because there are going to be things we learn from capitalism and things that evolve in capitalism that set the stage for socialism. We can't just skip over, we're not going to go from the right flyer to monoplanes. We're going to go through a long period of, the right flyer was also a biplane, uh, and we, you know, with, the, with wings over top of each other like this, uh, over the fuselage, and uh, they, there were things we learned over this period that allowed us to change the technology into the much faster and more stable planes of World War II and then, you know, Korean War and so on. Um, you can't just skip over one. Furthermore, there's an internal logic that we're not getting the geist telling us, hey, now you should do capitalism. Hey, now you should do socialism. There's an internal logic to the evolution of the system, uh, Marx is arguing, that if, if these things occurred in an alternate universe, 
they would still go through a very similar sequence of events. They would still go through, we're struggling with stability. Hey, we figured out stability. Uh, now let's make these suckers go really, really fast. And now let, let's make them go into space. Right? So uh, that, and I don't know if it's true or not. All right? But, 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 but uh, and there's a certain amount of it that, that, that's certainly appealing. The idea that there is a somewhat natural, I hate to word, use, use the word natural there, but, but uh, natural uh, sequence here that even if we were talking about an alternate universe, they wouldn't have gone from the right flyer to jets. There were things they had to learn in between. That it's logical that given the, g given the physics of flight, that this would follow from this, that this would follow from this, and so on. Marx is saying, given the internal logic of economic systems, it is logical that this moved to that and that moved to that, all right? And it's inevitable. It's going to happen, all right? Uh, we can try to speed it up if we want to, but it's going to happen, all right? So the, this sequence of events here is a sort of natural sequence of events in the same sense that this is. And um, we're not picking. The Geist isn't whispering in our ears, hey, now make monoplanes. Well, that's just what we've been working towards anyway. It's just going to happen. As the technology becomes better, we figure out how to do this. Nor is the Geist whispering in our ears, hey, now you should try capitalism. It just evolved into it. Right? Okay, so uh, let's see. What do I want next? Oh, yeah. L let me give you a sort of r extremely rough definition of each of those uh, economic systems, starting with capitalism. And what we got here, John? Two classes, workers and capitalists, where the latter exploit the former. Two classes. Workers and capitalists, where the latter exploit former. Socialism. One class where workers own the means of production. And if there's one class, I guess actually it's kind of classless, but one class where workers own the means of production, and then communism. You know, there used to be TV shows, TV series back in the 50s about hunting for communists. It'd be kind of fun to look, look those up and watch them. And then maybe hunt communists today. Uh, let's see. Classless society. That sounds like West Virginia. <laughs> I'm just kidding. My dad's from West Virginia. Classless society. in which everyone is free to pursue everyone is free to pursue whatever most interests them whatever most interests them. Hey, I'd be playing Call of Duty all day. All right, let's see here. Actually, I don't really like Call of Duty that much. Uh, uh, Fallout or um, uh, Far Cry. Uh, anyway, but I digress. Okay, so capitalism is the system we're in right now. And of course, as I say, Marx spends you know 99% of his time writing about this system. Uh, and then trying to discover what the elements are that are positive in helping us move to this system and are negative and are causing uh, workers alienation and exploitation uh, and eventually the breakdown of the system itself. The system itself is going to end up destroying itself. It's first going to be tremendously successful all over the planet and uh, you know, more and more countries become capitalist and an increasing number of tasks become associated with capitalism. For example, let's say you used to paint just for self-expression. Well, now you got to paint in order to earn a living. You got to, you know, paint commercially now. So capitalism takes over the planet. In many respects, globalism uh, and you know the, the the Chinese moving to some small extent towards capitalism. Um, that it was is fits 
Marx's theories much better than what happened in the Soviet Union and Cuba uh, and, and so on, because those countries weren't those countries went to socialism without ever going through capitalism. That didn't make sense. All right, so we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. But uh, again, the idea here is that first capitalism becomes tremendously successful all over the planet, uh, and only then or its internal weaknesses start to show up and start to break it down. It will be exploitative the whole time. Um, now, let's see. Socialism, if you looked from the air, looks just like capitalism. You, you just go, oh, there, there's some workers going to the factory, and there they are going home again. Well, how is this different from capitalism? There's no fancy side of town. There's no side of town with the huge houses uh, owned by the capitalists because the workers own the means of production collectively. So that Ford is owned in the same way the Fort Worth Public Library is. Who owns the Fort Worth Public Library? Well, we all do, right? So, uh, and who owns the University of Texas? Well, we all do. Who owns NASA? We all do. Who owns, uh, let's see, the Expo Dry Erase Marker Company. Well, the Expo Dry Erase Marker Company. But in this world, we all do. So everything is owned in this world in the same way as the Marine Corps is owned right now by all of us. So we have people who have to make decisions because we have people in the Marine Corps who have to make decisions. Uh, and at NASA and so on. But these people are not scraping income away from those who did the labor, right? So we're owning all this collective, but you get paid for sitting on the board and making decisions, but you don't get paid for, I don't have it on there, that was on the other one. You don't get paid for owning. Under socialism, no one gets paid just for owning something for owning some land, for owning a factory. I think that, you know, the best way to make sense of this Marxist argument is to consider somebody like Paris Hilton. I'm sure it's a wonderful person, Paris Hilton. But wasn't it her grandfather that started the Hilton uh, Hotel Empire? Uh, and she did nothing for that. She didn't do any labor whatsoever for that. I, I don't know, maybe she used to work the front desk. Uh, no labor for, uh, whatsoever for that, but because she owns part of the Hilton Empire now, she gets lots and lots of money. She doesn't have to actually go somewhere. And this is one of the one of the alternate arguments about how exploitation works. Uh, it doesn't have to be labor theory of value. If you're a worker, you have to spend eight hours at the factory in order to get the money. If you're a capitalist, you could spend those same eight hours in the Caribbean. It doesn't matter. You still get your money because you you earn only for owning. All right. So we get rid of that down here. There is no class of people who make money just from owning anymore. All right, uh, but, by the way, Marx points out this system isn't fair yet. He said, everyone gets paid the same, but you might have six kids and I've got three. That's not really fair. We all have different needs, right? We have different needs, so even if we reward people the same, it's not the equivalent to being fair to everyone because people have different needs. Maybe I have a kid with special needs and I need, uh, you know, more um, support uh, for education or whatever. So, he said, it's not fair yet. It's on its way. We've gotten rid of the class of people who just own. We needed that class. We needed them back here. They were instrumental in helping us reach this stage, but they were also harmful. So, we're going to get rid of them. And then finally, and I'm going to show you uh, here in a second what I'm talking about here. Finally, one day. Oh, well, let me read that to you. Uh, Marx. Um, Herdsman, uh, critical critic. Okay. Here we go. For as soon as the distribution of labor comes into being, each man, he's a sexist, has a particular, although uh, Engels was not his uh, co writer, um, each man has a particular exclusive sphere of activity which is forced upon him and from which he cannot escape. All right, so he's talking about capitalism. The division of labor in capitalism is such that if I want to earn a living, I've got to pick something out and I am best served to stick with it for the rest of my life, whether I like it or not. Uh, now, I happen to like what I'm doing, so it's not a problem for me, but he didn't like the idea that the division of labor.
that was so central to the productivity of capitalism also forced people into boxes. And it also forced you into a box that you may not care about at all, but you got to make a living, right? Uh, you don't get to do whatever most interests you. You have to do whatever earns a profit for a capitalist. Only things that earn a profit for a capitalist are legitimate pursuits. Marx wants you to major in whatever you want to major in without thinking about, but I got to get a job. So why should that be what drives our life? It is in this system. It simply is. That's the way this system works. But what he wants is a world where you're like, you know what, I kind of like philosophy. And I don't care if I can get a job with it or not. Or I kind of like finance and I don't care if I can get a job with it or not. Whatever it is. Uh, major in what you want. You have to major in something that you're going to get. You have to pick a major. You have to pick a specialization. You're probably stuck with it for the rest of your life. And it better make money for somebody. Otherwise, you're not going to get to make any money. So, going back to this quote, the first sentence is, for as soon as the distribution of labor comes into being, for him, same thing as division of labor, each man has a particular exclusive sphere of activity which is forced upon him and from which he cannot escape. He is a hunter, a fisherman, a herdsman, or a critical critic. What's a critical critic? Uh, and, and must remain so if he does not want to lose his means of livelihood. While in communist society, I should be holding a red pen, and I'll also hold my red's hat. Um, while in communist society, where nobody has one exclusive sphere of activity, but each can become accomplished in any branch he wishes, society regulates the general production. I'll tell you what he means by that in a minute. And thus makes it possible for me to do one thing today and another tomorrow. To hunt in the morning, to fish in the afternoon, to rear cattle in the evening, to criticize after dinner, just as I have a mind, without ever becoming a hunter, a fisherman, a herdsman, or a critic. You are not stuck doing what makes money for somebody. You get to do what makes you feel most fulfilled in life. All right? You get to, um, you know, what if uh, you love books and you want to write crappy stories, uh, you can do that in communist society. Because down here, the question of how much is going to get produced has been answered. All right, so, so I, I need to get into this a little deeper now to, to show you, to, to illustrate what he's talking about there. All right, so um, let's see what next. All right. Let me tell you what gets us from there to there, and then what I'm really leading to is what gets us from there to there. How do we make that jump? First of all, up here. Uh, a big factor in Marx as a plus and a minus is going to be the increase in technology that occurs under capitalism. It's tremendous. A huge benefit to humanity. The tremendous increase in technology. And it's going to eventually allow us to reach this stage down here. But um, it's also going to cause internal problems for capitalism. Okay? And there, and there's two major routes by which this problem occurs. Um, Basically, the problem is going to be, the problem for the system with technology is going to be replacing workers with machines. He says it's going to be really profitable in the short run to do that. But in the long run, it's going to cause problems that will eventually destroy capitalism. And doesn't that sound very familiar to what we're, what, what's in the news a lot today? Um, so, uh, two processes here. One, because as new technology is created, and lots of it's going to be created under capitalism, is Marx's view. All, right? There's these, all these new technologies. So, capitalists will be induced to replace their workers with machines because in the short run, it's much more profitable to do so. You know, we put in a bunch of self-checkout lines at Walmart and lay off a bunch of checkers. Let me just have like two people standing there watching the uh, uh, 10 um, self-checkout machines. Um, but that's going to raise unemployment higher and higher and higher. I mean, it'll go like this over time, but it's going like this in an upward trend, right? So, so unemployment in capitalism is going to trend upwards over decades. Now, in the meantime, often the workers are the biggest supporters of capitalism at all. They don't, they don't realize they're being exploited. They have a veil of consciousness over their eyes. They 
they are just as strong of believers in the system as everybody else. They don't realize they're being exploited until the unemployment starts going up. And with pain comes truth. I don't think Mark said that, but I just did. Increased pain leads to increased uh, truth. Or perhaps wokeness, if you will. Uh, that as these workers are displaced, as wages fall, because unemployment's going up, wages stagnate, then they're going to realize, wait a minute, we're getting screwed over. And one day, when the pain becomes too much, they will rise up, kill all the capitalists, and we will move into socialism. All right, so that, that, that's one of the problems. One of the problems is that as, uh, you know, the technology is really important, as I'm going to show you here in just a moment, in terms of reaching communism, but the technology is really important, but it also ends up destroying capitalism because it creates this incentive to replace workers with machines, which increases this, this pool, what he called the Industrial Reserve Army, this pool of, of uh, poor and unemployed people who reach a point where they're not going to take it anymore. And they, there's, you know, a tension point, and then it snaps, and then they rise up and kill all the capitalists, and yay, we move into socialism. Not a good day to be driving a Mercedes or a BMW, the day of the revolution. All right, uh, let's see. The other big factor, I don't actually talk about that one too much. I don't even know if I mentioned it in the book. I can't remember. Uh, but the other big factor that I do focus on in the book because of the fact that there are some other issues related to it uh, is the fact that Marx argued, and I've never quite understood this, Marx argued that you can exploit a worker, but you can't exploit a machine. So that you can work a worker for eight hours and pay him for four, but if you work a machine for eight hours, and it's you know, wear and tear and breaking down, you've got you to gotta do the, all the maintenance that's required. All right? so, so you can't work a machine above and beyond its level of maintenance. Maybe this is it. You can work a worker above and beyond their level of maintenance. You know, let's say that it's going to take uh, four hours of the work day to, for you to create enough value to feed yourself and your family. Okay, so I worked you for four hours and then another four hours. Those last four hours were all mine, all right? I took all that as the capitalist, whereas you can't do that to a machine. So, Marx is saying that as we replace workers with machine, not only does pain, uh, pain lead to truth, but also, well, let's see here. We often use pi for profits in economics because P was already taken by price. Also, it's going to drive profits down, in particular profit rates. Rates of profit will fall over time. Uh, because you can exploit a worker, but you can't exploit a machine. Now, you might wonder, well, then why replace your workers with machines at all? Because in the short run, you don't have a choice. When Walmart is replacing their checkout lanes with self-checkout, and I'm Target, i got to do the same thing because Walmart's cutting their prices by doing that. So, in the long run, we're screwed. But right now, i got no choice. And if I'm the first one to do it, then I actually get ahead of everybody else, for at least for a little bit. So, the entrepreneurs, the capitalists, I should say, are, are forced to do this, and they do so happily and willingly, because at least in the short run, uh, they're not looking at the long-run impact, how they might be dead by then. They're looking at the short-run impact of staying competitive, and perhaps even getting ahead of the pack. But in the long run, because you can only export a worker and not a machine, they're driving down their profit rates. And so over time in capitalism, unemployment goes up, profit rates go down, with the profit rates going down, we'll have more, uh, an increasing number and an increasing severity of uh, crises. If firms are on the border of profitability because this has gone down, then it doesn't take much of a downturn in economic activity to cause a recession and to cause a crisis. So when this is going down, it is making the, fin the, the business sector increasingly vulnerable to a downturn. And when this is, you know, when the unemployment's going up, not only is pain leading the truth, but they ain't got any money to buy the stuff. So this also contributes to the decline in the rates of profit. You've got this increasing unemployment. Ultimately, the workers have got to be paid in order to buy the stuff you made. Hey, that rhymes. So, uh, these processes are going to destroy capitalism. We're going to have the increasing unemployment and the falling rates of profit 
both arising from the increase in technology, which is going to be critical to going from here to here. But those two side effects of the increase in technology will eventually destroy capitalism. And you know, if, if I were a Marxist, I could look around the world right now and say, well, that seems pretty accurate. You know, that, that I, I would be able to find evidence of this. I would be able to look through the world with, with this framework in mind and be able to see evidence of this. And by the way, uh, something I wanted to mention here, and I jotted down down here, uh, is that, uh, and it's in the book too, uh, but you know, well, what about the USSR, you know, the Soviet Union? They were not, con they were not Marxists. They called themselves Marxists. They were dictators. All right. What they what they essentially did was, they took the landed aristocracy that was the way power was distributed under the czars, and just replaced it with them. They said, okay, well, the Communist Party is now are now the dictators. A very a very autocratic. Uh, I, I have found a nice um, source for this that's quoted in the book, uh, but a very traditional autocratic Russian system, which is not unlike today again, that, this, that, you know, that, that the Russian people are not like torn up about the fact that Putin is president for life, or whatever he decided to be now. And nor were they particularly, you know, they had a very short period of democracy, extremely short, wasn't very successful, uh, and so they're not like in love with democracy. So the Soviet Union was hardly what Marx was arguing. Um, now, does that make Marxism right? No, but it does say that the collapse of the Soviet Union is, is not an example of, of the collapse of Marxist theories because that's not what he was talking about. Marx was actually a big believer in Western freedoms, in, in the idea of, of uh, you know, freedom of speech. And, and remember, ultimately what he wants everyone to be is extremely free to live their lives the way they want to. Uh, so, uh, let's see, let's move on to this transition right here. Man, I love this stuff. Like I said uh, in an earlier video, even when I'm lecturing over something I don't necessarily believe, it's fun. Laying out the argument, thinking about the different uh, premises, the validity, the cogency, and it keeps me off the streets. All right, what about that final shift from socialism to communism? And let me read that last part of Marx here again where he's describing communism. Uh, let's see. While in communist society, where nobody has one exclusive sphere of activity, but each can become accomplished in any branch he wishes, society regulates the general production. I'm going to have to explain that. And thus makes it possible for me to do one thing today, another tomorrow, yada, yada, yada. Right. The idea is that under communism, the level of technology has increased so much that we, that, that we solve our true economic problems with a touch of a button that we are no longer working ourselves to death just to make just to have enough food, shelter and clothing and so on. That we have this and, and the best way I can think of to explain it is to use Star Trek. All right. So, Star Trek Next Generation. Uh, when did that start? Let's find out. When did Star Trek Next Generation start? 1987. Yeah. That was the year I moved here. And when did Star Trek, the original series, end? 1969. Okay, so the original Star Trek series ended uh, uh, almost, uh, almost 20 years uh, before Next Generation started. So, okay. Uh, I'm assuming that almost everyone is familiar with the phenomenon in the original Star Trek of beaming in and out, right? Uh, that you're uh, on the Enterprise and you need to get down to the planet. And uh, what I read, one of the things I read was that they were trying to figure out how we're going to get down to the planet. They got to get it like in a shuttle every time, you know? What if we could just beam them down there? All right, so they said, hey, uh, you stand there on the transporter and the transporter changes matter to energy. It shoots that energy to the surface of the planet and then changes it back to matter again, hopefully in the same order it was when it started. So that's how the transport is supposed to work. It's supposed to go uh, matter, energy, matter. I'll write that down here. Matter, energy, matter. So you're on the Enterprise, 
they, they, they change into energy and beam you to the planet when they change it back into you again. All right. Uh, well, when they were doing next generation, they got to thinking, hey, wait a minute. Why can't we just do this? Why can't we take the power from the ship's engines and just make something? Because what the computer is doing here, theoretically, is uh, when they're beaming, is first the computer is figuring out how are you put together. Then it is changing you. And then it uses what it you know, uh, uh, coded into the computer earlier to decide how to put you back together again. Well, what if we already know what a T-bone what a steak looks like? What if we already know its, it's um, chemical composition, the atoms, the molecules, and so forth? Then all we got to do is walk up to the replicator machine. Oops. Like Captain Jean-Luc Picard does. And say, T, Earl Grey. Which, by the way, is an extremely uncommon T in England. Uh, I don't know why he always... But first of all, he's Jean-Luc Picard with an English accent who drinks the wrong kind of tea. Anyway, that, that's uh, another issue. So he just walks up to the replicator machine and he can say, you know, T-bone steak, medium rare. Uh, it creates it, because it just goes straight from the, uh, you know, we're, we're assuming that the um, dilithium crystals are creating extra energy. And so we're just going straight from energy to matter, all right? So that's what they do in Next Generation. In Next Generation, there's replicator machines uh, and you walk up and say what you want and it just creates it from energy because they've, uh, and they based it on the idea from the, from the previous show. Okay, let's say this is a real technology. Now, let's say we've got big replicator machines. So you could like walk up and say Mustang 68 red. Oh, convertible. Uh, and then it just creates it. And we've got this, you know, tremendous source of energy from the sun or whatever that we're using uh, before we all die uh, from whatever we're going to kill ourselves from. And um, let's say this is true. Now we've got communism. Because now we are no longer tied to one job. We've got, we have to have some people who are interested in making replicator machines and maintaining them. Uh, and one of the assumptions that the early economists, and, and in, including Marx, people like to work. Uh, people enjoy doing, not necessarily work at a job, but people enjoy doing things to make their lives um, meaningful. Because what kind of species would evolve that really didn't want to do anything? It would die, all right? So if, if uh, early Homo sapiens are like, I guess we could go hunt some mastodons, but God, that seems like a lot of work. They're like, no, man, let's go hunt some mastodons. We're going to dig a big hole, chase them in there, cut them up, eat them, have a party. All right, so uh, we are enthused about doing things. We have a, what, what Thorsten Veblen called an instinct of workmanship. We want to do things. So let, let's hope we have some people who like making replicator machines, you know, that they just enjoy the physics and so forth. We can do whatever the hell we want after that, all right? Um, hey, I'd like to be a, uh, a critical critic today or a herdsman or a fisherman or whatever. This is where Marx says, society regulates the general production. The, the society, the level of technology is so high that we uh, are able to really not worry at all about producing the goods and services that were required to, to maintain life for another day. And therefore we are freed finally from that need to, for, of division of labor that still existed under socialism, all right? Uh, and we are finally in a, part, in, in a place where, as Marx says, um, from each according to their abilities to each according to their needs. Only at this point is it possible. Now, okay, I got a little graph here to show you. This is kind of the way I think about it. Okay, Homo sapien history. And here's our level of technology, tech, all right? Um, and I, I did this the other day, didn't I? Uh, and I never found the right answer. When did Homo sapien sapien evolve? I don't want Homo sapiens, I want Homo sapien sapien. Uh, let's see here. For 30 years. Uh, ah, maybe 300,000 years ago, but most research says 200,000. Okay, so here's oh, well, no, I don't want 2020. Sorry, all right. 
So there's 200,000 BC. Um, let's see. When did Homo sapiens domesticate animals? Oh, good for us. Around 100,000 BC. Okay, so uh, let's track the level of technology of Homo sapiens from 200,000 BC. We're idiots, we're idiots, we're idiots, we're idiots, we're a little bit smarter. So we've got a bit of an increasing slope, right? But then we hit the Industrial Revolution. And let's see when the internet thinks that started. 1800, oh no, we'll find out. When did the Industrial Revolution start? 1760 to 1840, uh, the um, midpoint of which is 1800. So that's pretty close. All right. Uh, so right in that area right there, uh, right about 1800 is the middle of it. So here's what Marx is thinking. So I think. Boom! Now the technology skyrockets, right? Uh, and we're going to eventually reach a point here in capitalism where the uh, workers get fed up, the firms are all breaking down and stuff, and we go, and I'm sorry, I should also mark this, it's not just the Industrial Revolution, it's also capitalism. There's capitalism. Uh, and then we're going to eventually reach a point where the workers are ticked off and uh, they rise up and kill all the capitalists. Yay! Then we get socialism, right? Now, we're assuming the increase in technology continues. But eventually, there is some level of technology that represents that which is associated with the replicator machines and society, what is he said, regulating the general production. So as soon as the green line hits that red dash line, we can party like it's whatever year it is. There's communism, all right? So, that's what he's thinking in terms of the evolution of one stage to another. And again, notice here the critical role of technology. And by the way, the Soviets, when they were around, were really sensitive about this. Because they knew that the idea that the technology is supposed to keep increasing was, was there. Uh, and so, and for a while, it was really embarrassing. They had the first satellite in space. They uh, 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 were um, advancing. Well, they had the first person in space. Uh, and so there was a lot of fear for military reasons as well, of course. Uh, but they were really proud of that. Um, and uh, again, I said it wasn't exactly a, a Marxist society, although they certainly fancied themselves as such. Uh, so. That's when the final revolution takes place, and you can do whatever the hell you want with your life. You can major in whatever you want to major in. You don't have to go to college if you don't want to. If you want to go out and cut trees down in the forest and cause deforestation, go ahead. Uh, let's see. That's it for that concept. I've just got one left for Marxism, and that's all.